You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. As business and innovation come together, digital transformation isn't a future concept. It's happening right now. As industrial organizations modernize their infrastructure, it introduces new cyber risks, but also offers a unique opportunity to instrument OT for improved cybersecurity and operational resilience. Join me and my friends from AWS, Splunk, and Dragos on August 3rd at 2 p.m. Eastern Time for a live panel on securing digital transformation, OT cybersecurity innovation and resilience, where we'll dive in to secure digital transformation, managing OT and IT cyber risk, and the value and vision of cloud resources. For more information about the webinar and to register for the live event, visit thecyberwire.com slash dragos or see our show notes for details. Meet Mimecast. They're in the business of taking companies at risk of cyber attack and putting them at ease. Picture this. It's Monday morning. You're cruising through hundreds of unread emails. Your impulse to promptly click, download, or respond could be a prompt to launch a cyber attack. An email address is a direct digital path to the mind, the machine, and the data of every person in your organization. It needs better security. I know what you're thinking. I'm all set. I have Microsoft 365 protection, Dave. It might not be enough. That's where Mimecast comes in. They've developed a system that fortifies your email security and reduces costs, risks, and complexities, enabling you and your business to work protected. So before you click your next email, visit Mimecast.com to start your free 30-day trial. An illicit market in account restoration, resilience in the cyber workforce, new post-exploitation techniques in Amazon Web Services, incursions into Norwegian government networks went on for four months. Rob Boyce from Accenture Security describes a perfect storm in the dark web threat landscape. Carol Terrio shares mental health social media warnings for teens. And the Russian legislation seeks to reduce or eliminate online privacy. I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire Intel Briefing for Wednesday, August 2nd, 2023. Being banned from any platform is unpleasant. It can seem arbitrary or unfair. And it's often either beyond the possibility of appeal or can be appealed only at considerable cost in time and expense. It's a particularly troublesome experience for third-party sellers in the Amazon marketplace who face a loss of income in addition to simple inconvenience. A market has grown up in which brokers offer assistance in restoring banned sellers' accounts. They often do so, however, illicitly. CNBC reports that the brokers frequently work by offering kickbacks to Amazon insiders who take advantage of their position to override bans. Amazon isn't alone. Other large third-party markets are facing similar problems, but Amazon's size makes the problem particularly evident. Christy DiStefano, an Amazon spokesperson, told CNBC, There is no place for fraud at Amazon, and we will continue to pursue all measures to protect our store and hold bad actors accountable. In addition to account restoration services, company insiders have also been found selling internal data, the better to help third-party sellers game the company's system to better position themselves for success in the online market. Immersive Labs has released its Cyber Workforce Benchmark Report, noting significant improvements in response time to cyber incidents. The report notes organizations' median response time to emerging threats improved by one-third, indicating a significant increase in the speed of response 
and continued progress compared to the year prior. Enterprises have enhanced their knowledge about newly discovered threats and vulnerabilities, enabling them to respond more rapidly than ever before. The researchers point to the Log4J crisis as a watershed moment that could well have been a catalyst for this urgency given its catastrophic impact on organizations around the world. Mitiga has published a report looking at a new potential post-exploitation technique in AWS. The technique involves running AWS's System Manager agent as a remote-access trojan on both Linux and Windows machines, controlling the endpoint using another AWS account. The researchers explain... The SSM agent, a legitimate tool used by admins to manage their instances, can be repurposed by an attacker who has achieved high-privileged access on an endpoint with SSM agent installed to carry out malicious activities on an ongoing basis. This allows an attacker who has compromised a machine hosted on AWS or anywhere else to maintain access to it and perform various malicious activities— Unlike using common malware types, which are often flagged by antivirus software, using an SSM agent in this malicious manner allows the attacker to benefit from the reputation and legitimacy of this binary to cover their tracks. Cato Security has published its 2023 Cloud Threat Findings Report, finding that SSH is by far the most commonly targeted service by cloud-focused threat actors. The report states... Since SSH is a protocol used across the Internet, not just in cloud infrastructure, this statistic is unsurprising. SSH allows secure communication between clients and servers and is typically used for server administration. This often means that SSH servers are Internet-facing and can pose an easy target if inadequately secured. The researchers also found that botnet agents are the most common form of malware targeting cloud services, stating... The vast majority of observed traffic is dedicated to spreading common botnet families. These include Mirai, XOR DDoS, and IRC Bot, a generic name for botnets making use of the IRC protocol. It's worth noting that samples categorized as Mirai may actually be one of the many existing variants of this malware. Investigators have concluded that a cyber espionage campaign against Norwegian government networks lasted four months before it was detected and action taken to stop it, Bloomberg reports. The effort, generally attributed to Russian intelligence services, exploited a now-patched vulnerability in Ivanti Endpoint Manager Mobile. Yesterday, CISA and the Norwegian National Cybersecurity Center released a joint cybersecurity advisory on the incident. The advisory, which includes extensive advice on detection, remediation, and prevention, says... Mobile device management systems are attractive targets for threat actors because they provide elevated access to thousands of mobile devices, and APT actors have exploited a previous mobile iron vulnerability. Consequently, CISA and NCSCNO are concerned about the potential for widespread exploitation in government and private sector networks. And finally, Torrent Freak, writing with outrage, describes a bill signed into law by President Putin on Monday. Federal law number 406-FZ will prohibit foreign email systems, and it will require all domestic platforms to verify the identity of all users by government-approved methods. VPNs aren't banned outright, but the VPN services remaining in operation in Russia are compliant with state regulations and afford little, if any, anonymity or privacy. Attempting to evade identity verification requirements will be risky, as the new laws criminalize preparation to make such attempts. Posting information online that amounts to advice on how to use VPNs, Tor, and similar tools for circumvention purposes will be considered a crime. On top, regular hosting providers will be subjected to state registration and new obligations along similar lines to those imposed on VPN providers. The law is an example of what foreign policy calls Russia's return to its totalitarian past. Information control, censorship, and draconian suppression of dissent are becoming the norm. Coming up after the break, Rob Boyce from Accenture Security describes a perfect storm in the dark web threat landscape 
Carol Terrio shares mental health social media warnings for teens. Stay with us. Struggling to secure on-prem apps with modern identity? Don't worry, you're not alone. Join industry leaders from Fortune 500 organizations to secure your apps on any cloud with any IDP, regardless of your environment's complexity. Meet Strata's identity orchestration platform, Mavericks. Say goodbye to the headaches of app refactoring and legacy tech debt. With identity orchestration, you can modernize legacy apps to use MFA or passwordless authentication in a few weeks, migrate from one IDP to another, and so much more without changing the app. No matter your IAM use case, Strata extends the value of your current identity investments. And the best part? You can try it for free today. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire to share your biggest identity challenge, and they'll hook you up with a complimentary pair of AirPods Pro. Don't miss out. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire. That's strata.io slash cyberwire. And now a word from our sponsor, Halcyon. Ransomware is still one of the largest threats facing businesses in 2023. The Halcyon platform was built to stop it through a multi-layered protection approach featuring full encryption key capture, automated decryption, and the ability to prevent other security tools on the endpoint from being unhooked. Learn more about how they're leveraging capsule network-based machine learning to reduce ransomware recovery times down to minutes by visiting halcyon.ai. If you have a teen, and I do, chances are you are concerned about how much time that teen spends online on social media platforms. Carol Terrio has been looking into the mental health of teens on social media platforms. and She files this report. In mid-May, the American Psychological Association, the APA, issued sweeping recommendations intended to help teens use social media safely. This was the first guidance of its kind. And just a few weeks later, the Surgeon General for the United States warned of an urgent public health issue regarding social media usage and youth mental health. The U.S. Surgeon General... Dr. Vivek H. Murthy, called for more research to determine the extent of mental health and its impact on young people, including the type of content generating the most harm, societal factors that could protect youth, and ways in which social media can be beneficial. Quote, to date, the burden of protecting youth has fallen predominantly on children, adolescents, and their families. The entire burden of mitigating the risk of harm of social media cannot be placed on the shoulders of children and parents, unquote. Yes, yes, and yes. It has fallen on parents to manage, and from what they tell me, it is as thorny as a prickly pear. On one side, as a parent, your job is to keep your kids safe, and being able to see where they are and be contactable is a pretty big component of safety. So what do you do? You give your kid a phone. But then there's the whole manner of the content available, the entire digital world at their fingertips, including the socials. Cited reasons as to why social media is not good for kids are numerous. They interfere with social work in grades. They're addictive. They increase anxiety and depression. They interfere with sleep. They can expose kids to inappropriate content. The Cleveland Clinic says that it can also impact daily behaviors and moods, with kids perhaps showing signs of increased irritability, increased anxiety, and even lack of self-esteem. So the U.S. Surgeon General called on social media companies to prioritize safety and privacy in their product designs and ensure minimum age requirements are enforced. For example, most social media platforms have a minimum user age of 13, which Murthy says he believes is too early for kids to be on social media, describing the age as a time when kids are developing their identity and sense of self. 
So until regulations catch up, what is a parent to do? Psychologists say that adolescent brain development starts around age 10 and continues through early adulthood. The APA cautions that sites that use like buttons and artificial intelligence to encourage excessive scrolling may be dangerous for developing brains and recommends limiting social media on these types of platforms through phone settings. And in addition to the limits, the APA strongly encourages ongoing discussions about social media use and active supervision, especially in early adolescence. Parents are encouraged to model healthy social media use, including taking social media holidays as a family. I am not a social media addict, thank the lords, but many of my friends, including those with children, are. And it may be time to put that phone away when the kids are around. I know, I know. This was Carol Terrio for The Cyberwire. And it is always my pleasure to welcome back to the show Robert Boyce. He is Global Lead for Cyber Resilience and Managing Director at Accenture. Uh, Rob, it's great to have you back. I, I want to touch today on some work that I know you and your colleagues there at Accenture are doing when it comes to some things you're tracking on the dark web. What's going on here? Yeah, thanks, David. First of all, it's always a pleasure to be here. So thank you again for hosting me. Uh, yeah, we, we've actually been seeing a really interesting uptick in the uh, focus uh, of threat actors in OT systems, you know, and I think OT systems have you know long been vulnerable to cyber attacks, and we've known that, and we have seen some very focused attacks in the past. Uh, but you know, quite honestly, the majority of OT impacts we see today uh, are usually uh, a leakage from an IT incident or you know some self-imposed um, shutdown due to uncertainty of what an IT incident uh, may ha- may cause to an hmm. OT environment. Um, and so we've never, you know, and I would say maybe even before 2021, right, when we saw the Colonial Pipeline uh, disruption, we saw threat actors really stay away from crossing the line into national critical infrastructure and oil and gas uh, due to potential, you know, what, what it could mean, uh, you know, in, in the state of, you know, real potential warfare. Um, and then uh, when we actually saw that event happen, because there was so much focus on this area, we saw a lot of dark web marketplaces take down uh, their OT uh, tools and advertisements and, and things that they were talking about because they just didn't want to have that focus. It was just too but much then, heat? I think a little bit too much heat, yeah. yeah. And, and, and then what we saw uh, starting really when the Russia-Ukraine conflict happened is those rules started to go a bit out the window. And so, you know, our team has, who has been researching this, we've seen a significant uptick really around into May this year, where we're seeing more and more threat actors on the dark web start talking about uh, targeting OT systems. And really, OT systems of Western national critical infrastructure, uh, as well as oil and gas. That's been the focus. And when we say targeting, what, what exactly are, are we talking about here? They're looking to buy access into these environments. They're looking for people who are creating exploits within the OT infrastructure or OT systems so that they are able to, you know, of course, successfully be able to cause disruption. I think the thing that's really fascinating to me here is we're seeing, this is one of the first times I've seen this, where we're seeing three different ideologies really have motivations in this space, meaning, you know, we're seeing hacktivists, of course, want to be able to target OT systems to, you know, maybe make headlines in a meaningful way by causing, you know, national disruptions. Uh, We're seeing financially motivated cyber criminals get into the space, just, of course, big surprise for money. Uh, And and as as we see more and more um, requests or more and more demand you know, obviously there's more interest for these financially motivated criminals to be able to produce, um, you know, produce uh, materials, uh, assets that that can help further exploitation in OT environments. And then we're seeing, of course, the political motivated um, threat actors. And this is largely, as you can imagine, representing Russia against all enemies of Russia. That's the most popular we're seeing there. Uh, But it's been, it's been quite interesting to see these three ideologies for one of the first times I've seen all come together with a singular mission, but for different purposes. 
And is it kind of coincidental that, that those th- three different directions are confer- converging? I don't know if it's coincidental. I, I really, again, I do think that the Russia-Ukraine conflict has opened the door to, uh, I want to say encourage this behavior, but to, to make it not as, uh, to make it more acceptable, right? Like, so I, I feel like, the, and a lot of it is in terms of, you know, hacktivists, again, targeting Western, primarily Western national critical infrastructure, as well as oil and gas, to, it, it, to, because of, you know, in support of uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, the political motivations similar. And, and, you know, and when you have financially motivated criminals, I think they just follow the money, right, where the demand is. So I, I don't know if it's is, is coincidental. I think it's just all of the right reasons came together to really create almost what we would say is a perfect storm of opportunity for these three groups. Yeah. So based on what you all are seeing here, what are your recommendations for those folks who are responsible for OT security? Great question. And this has been uh, quite honestly a a challenge we've seen in industry. I think there's been this um, false notion that attackers will not be as successful in OT environments because there's this concept of logical and physical separation, which we now know, well, even if it was ever true, I'm not sure, but we now know is definitely not true because we're seeing that leakage from IT to OT consistently when we see the disruptions in OT today. And as well, like there's a huge investment that needs to be made by threat actors to maybe even purchase physical equipment to try and find uh, vulnerabilities within that equipment. But now that these threat actors are so well funded, that and the the equipment's much more readily available, even that is reduced the barrier to entry uh, for for interest here. So, you know, the first thing I would say is organizations who have a large OT footprint, especially again in, you know, national critical infrastructure and, and oil and gas need to understand that the threats to the OT environment are the same as the threats to the IT environment. And I always find it interesting because the OT operators, they measure their business in terms of minutes sometimes uh, of as far as, you know, downtime is it a direct correlation to impacted revenue loss. And, and so, you know, the way that they think about OT, they think about it more from resiliency, from uptime, uh, human safety, uh, and so what we find works very well is to create those same themes from a security perspective and start to educate um, the OT operators on why cyber risk is, this, is a very similar risk as that you would see and how it directly impacts resiliency and uptime and revenue. And so I guess, again, going back to your question, in the spirit of like, it's, it, it's, it just needs to be a, a business objective to secure OT. Uh, and the risks there need to be understood clearly. And the messaging of the importance of cyber really needs to be framed up in a way that the OT owners and operators will understand and how it correlates to the impact of their business. All right. Well, Robert Boyce is Global Lead for Cyber Resilience and Managing Director at Accenture. Rob, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Dave. Tired of cybersecurity mega conferences? MWISE is different. With a focused agenda and targeted problem solving, MWISE is where security's best go to get better. From September 18th through the 20th in Washington, D.C., you'll join a special community of security's sharpest minds. Hear perspectives you might not get anywhere else. And reach a new level of mastery that'll prepare you for what's next. Register early and save at mwise.mandiant.com slash conf23. That's mwise.mandiant.com forward slash conf23. And that's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at cyberwire at n2k.com. Your feedback helps us ensure we're delivering the information and insights that help keep you a step ahead in the rapidly changing world of cybersecurity. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like The Cyberwire are part of the daily intelligence routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, 
as well as the critical security teams supporting the Fortune 500 and many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Liz Irvin and senior producer Jennifer Iben. Our mixer is Trey Hester, with original music by Elliot Peltzman. The show was written by John Petrick. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And now, a word from our sponsor, Sintiat. As an 8A hub zone minority and woman-owned small business company, Sintiat specializes not only in software engineering, but in artificial intelligence and cybersecurity as well. Sintiat's customers, and they retain those customers, include the U.S. Department of Defense, the intelligence community, and the Departments of State and Justice. Their mission is to protect the systems that protect the people who protect us. If you're looking for a partner in accomplishing your mission, check out Cintiot.com. That's C-I-N-T-E-O-T.com. Your partners in everything data and cybersecurity. security.